Okay, welcome back. As I said, we have an exciting part two of this summit starting now. And to further examine the concept of both the European capitals of culture and other large collaborative events and indigenous representation, we want to look at the artists, the curators, and the indigenous culture workers. How do they see the potential of these large scale projects? Can they serve as a platform for meaningful dialogue and even reconciliation? And are they, these events, important representations of SAPMI today? Thomas Kolbengsson, renowned Sami artist, Aula Guttarm, and uh, Oli Idrisiak, that you have already met from the National Gallery in Canada, will all present their views and perspectives on these questions. And after that, we will not have a panel discussion, but instead, we will immediately after these presentations do a coffee break with an add-on. I want you to discuss these perspectives and your own perspectives concerning the things that we have heard today and the discussions that we have had and prepare for the two last panels on future and upcoming Arctic European capitals of culture. How do we ensure and secure Sami contribution, self-determination and decision-making in these future projects? That's the big question of today. So first, everyone, please welcome Thomas Kolbengsson. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm first here. Okay, my name is Thomas Kolbengsson. I'm a Chappis Yulke. I'm an Oriel Sami, Telna Sebotan. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Thomas Kolbengtsson. It means black legs. I have white legs, but my name is like that. And uh, I come from Tärna. Um, I gonna. I was asked to to have an art uh, historic uh, <laughs> kind of uh, education, and I'm doing some uh, from an indigenous perspective onto. Uh, indigenous and uh, modernistic art. So, uh, as you see here, indigenous art, so-called primitive art, I will talk 10 minutes, I hope. And I have a lot of pictures. Uh, I tried to come to a conclusion in the end. So, the, in Uppsala, the, the main church, Christian church, in Uppsala, is in Uppsala. And you can see the physical representation of, of an idea is very powerful. That's why I'm looking forward to a Swedish Sami parliament building, because it, it is needed. And the closest building to the church is actually the Racial Biologic Institute. So you can see it's uh, so close to the state religion. It was state religion in Sweden up to 1950. Now it's like uh, you are free to have uh, your own religion. Anyway, these uh, ideas of measurement and determine different uh, uh, races is, uh, I believe, uh, a way for a scientific way for the state to, to prove that uh, so-called the state as superiority to minority classes, like Sami, Roms, Tornedalinga. Here are actually my uh, grandmother's uh, measurements and her family, Bonta. So, so I got that. But I start with um, Pocahontas, when, when she saved Captain John Smith in Virginia, 1607. And she was probably the first uh, indigenous who was baptized in Nor Northern America. And uh, they took her to uh, England. She was presented to the Queen Mary as the emperor of the 
as the daughter of the emperor of Virginia. And she'll, st still there is this stereotype of Pocahontas and Disney movies. <clears throat> also, um, James Cook, when he, he was the first in Pacific, so to say, first Western to be in Pacific. And they met in Tahiti, wonderful uh, woman and nice paradi paradise way of living. And so the sailor came back to London and told the, those stories. And we still have this idea of uh, Polynesia's uh, paradise for, well, free sex and uh, a nice paradisic uh, way of living. And the French uh, painter Paul Gauguin, he was uh, born in France but grew up in uh, Peru, in Lima. And, and his upbringing was described as, as he was like a young prince, he had uh, indigenous servants. Undoubtedly, he was so indigenous Peruvian art. But the family, when he was 10 years, the family had to go back to Paris. Uh, and uh, he read the bestseller novel about uh, a French sailor who, who went to Tahiti and married a Polynesian uh, princess. So Gauguin got that idea, oh, I do that also, which he did. I mean, uh, Tahiti was a colony of, uh, of France. And uh, he, uh, yeah, he married the 14-year-old girl. And, but he also, he was also, he, he had this feeling, he, he has this understanding what indigenous art was about. Yeah, that it wasn't kind of a bourgeois environment. It was more like a connection to the, to the gods and to the nature, indigenous art. So this uh, is one of his uh, examples of, um, of uh, the goddess of love. And you can see in front there's a table. It's like the, you bring the offerings to the, to the goddess. So he was inspired by, you know, Polynesian shrines, religious objects. And Picasso, he saw this uh, exhibition in uh, Paris, the Gauguin exhibition, and was very inspired of it. He collected himself indigenous art. And he also, Picasso also had this uh, revelation what indigenous art is about, or I would rather say what art is about. It's our connection to, to a spiritual world, so to say. And also you can see, it's also a way of thinking, the colonial thinking that, you know, you can use uh, mining ores and timber, lumber, and uh, water power, but you can also use uh, culture as a raw material and work it for free. So Picasso kind of copied the uh, Marquise and uh, Polynesian and African sculptures. And it's, it's uh, I mean, it isn't wrong, but it's a mismatch because the work of Picasso and Gauguin and Matisse this I will show, cost several billion Swedish crowns. You could actually buy one of the Marquis Island uh, of one of the paintings that Gauguin actually made in Marquis Island. That was bought in, in Dubai. I think it's uh, four billion uh, Swedish crowns. And that uh, painting is now in a, you know, in a, a kind of a, in a vault, you can't see it. It's more like making money out of culture, like bills. Okay, but Picasso, he, um, he tried, he carved out in oil. Oh, five minutes, my God. <laughs> anyway, he, he did this uh, representation with, uh, you see the sacrifice table in front of the goddesses. And Matisse was one that uh, also was inspired by Picasso, and he 
also used in indigenous Inuit art, Greenlandic art, in his art. And uh, we have the most famous uh, sculptor in England, Henry Moore. He was uh, heavily influenced by Maya. And you have also, this is a, a spoon from, uh, from West Africa. Uh, anthropomorphic spoon, it's kind of man, human spoon. And uh, Giacometti's spoon is like a hundred times more valuable than the original, so to say. And also in contemporary artists like Lu Louise Bourgeois, her husband was uh, director of a primitive art museum in New York. And undoubtedly, he had a great influence on her work. This is a, this is a bag in, from Greenland. And uh, this is Louis Borgeras' um, sculptures. And, and you come to um, Navajo people in Arizona. They're using sand painting as a shamanic ritual. Jackson Pollock, when he was a teenager, he, he was uh, visiting Navajo during the, these ceremonies. So you can see they have the same method of getting into a trance, trance uh, situation. Uh, but uh, the thing I object about is that uh, art critics says, well, Jackson Pollock was actually the first American artist. But of course, I mean, he was doing the thing that the indigenous in the US have already done. Also the, so to say, creator of the land art, Robert Smithson, hit that spiral in Utah. You can see the people on the, on the jetty. But uh, already the year 1000 or 800, you have this spiral in Ohio by indigenous. And Sweden, in Jarmar Lundbom in, in uh, Kiruna, he had also this idea that let's bring in artists and they can take inspiration from indigenous, from Sami art. So here is among with the savages. Uh, and uh, Andersson and Liljefors was there. And uh, John Bauer was one of the was their most, I would say, and he has taken photo. I think it's uh, actually relative of Osa Simma, this woman. Anyway, you can see that the troll got this Sami Gapta and Votek dress. And the more you can see that in the end, the troll is, I mean, the princess is, I wouldn't say that she is Sami, but I guess that the troll is, is kind of Sami. And, and you can see this is a masquerade costume from Finland, also in comedy, you know. Uh, so, um, so this I resist the idea still exists. So I, I actually made uh, the first official so, Sapmi sign. I mean, what is Sapmi? I mean, Sapmi is the land where Sami people live and work and has own. So I put it outside the Swedish parliament two years ago. I was almost arrested. I had to take it away. But I kind of made a kind of statement. But I discovered that the word Sapmi does not even today exist in Swedish Academy, uh, you know, word list, diction. You have a San Marino and even Gothenburg, but you don't have Sápmi. And why, did, why this? Well, I mean, if, if the Swedish Academy accept uh, Sápmi, then they accept that Sámi has a right to our country. Uh, so this is a future vision. This is from my home area in Tärna, between the border, that when you enter at least where there are Sámi, Sami villages, you should have that you enter Sápmi. And it, it's actually double-sided. So from Norway, you see you enter European vision and Sápmi. Uh, once uh, happens that my art actually got arrested, and it was during the, the court uh, uh,
conflict in, uh, in Luxele Tingsträtten. And uh, it's about the right to the Sami village that is ongoing. And I, I did a kind of representation of the, of the people that first came, you know, the, the northern Sami that came to our southern Sami land, but it was arrested actually and uh, put in jail. I had to take it out myself. And uh, last, I would say that we have this uh, art, uh, indigenous art tour in the US and Canada. We have been in Whitehorse. And now it, we are in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> in Twin City, Minneapolis, where we had a collaboration with the Dakota people and uh, many uh, joint exhibition with, uh, well, 12 indigenous artists also. So it, it uh, proves actually that uh, indigenous art has a really strong uh, visual promoting indigenous people, political. So we have also in the Venice Biennial this year, indigenous people from Brazil will be represented and also from South America. And I know that in Chile and uh, has also indigenous artists. So. I guess that's 10 minutes. Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. And thank you for raising the question about cultural appropriation that, we'll, that we will discuss also in the last two uh, panels. And I also have to add that at the Venice Biennial this year, the Danish pavilion is all Inuit, with Inutek Stork, Stork the great photographer. There's chocolate and a walking stick. Thank you. Uh, yes. Over to Oli. Uh, brief presentation about the artistic and curatorial perspectives on these matters. Okay. Just me coming up? <laughs> Just you coming up. Okay. <clears throat> You have a mic on, you can sit down, yep. you can stand, you can have yeah. some water. I'll sit. Wonderful. Um, so something that I just wanted to talk about, uh, given the opportunity to do a little talk again, uh, was the fact that um, <sighs> joining the National Gallery team in the Indigenous Ways and Decolonization Department, right now we have uh, actually three Inuit in our department, um, which is a first for the National Gallery. Um, we have myself um, at, in a support role as curatorial assistant, then we have Jocelyn Perinen, who's an associate curator specializing in Inuit art. And then there's Renelta Arluk, who is a manager of uh, protocol, policy, and strategic initiatives. Um, so it's just really important to have uh, this representation at varying levels within the gallery. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, what's really interesting is we were talking about recently how even though we're all Inuit, we come from different regions, we come from different dialects, um, and we have these different um, strengths and um, roles that we bring to the table. So we're not just token Inuit within the gallery, we're all filling different roles within the gallery. Um, and I think that's super important. And I also have these two really brilliant Inuit to look up to within my career. Um, so that has been super special coming into the curial, curatorial department in that way. Um, yeah, so I'm also a writer and artist myself, so I bring that into my role um, as a curatorial assistant. and. The three ways that I usually approach things uh, in my writing, um, in my curatorial projects, is through ecology, kinship, and storytelling. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm coming from. And I don't know, I guess I could just talk about another project that I did when I was at the University of Lethbridge Art Gallery recently. Last year, I curated a show that featured Inuit artworks that didn't have the name attached to them. So uh, it's a widespread uh, problem that many indigenous artworks within collections um, and museums uh, are unattributed. 
Um, so I took the opportunity to do a research project. It started as a research project within that gallery uh, to look at the 124 artworks that were unidentified. And what's really interesting is that Lethbridge is a small city in southern Alberta. And just context-wise, it's very far away from the north. Um, and I was maybe one of two Inuit living in the city. So um, it was super special to be able to uh, work with the Inuit art collection in the school that I went to, but also so far away from our homelands. Um, anyways, a little bit of context there. So out of the 124 un unidentified Inuit artworks, I was able to name 36 of them, attach them to individual artists using syllabics, which is our writing system. Uh, and also uh, disc numbers, which were uh, numbers that were assigned to Inuit from the federal government um, from the 30s to the 70s-ish. Um, my dad's generation was one of the last generations to receive those numbers, so a lot of Inuit would sign their names in their disc numbers. Um, so it was really interesting seeing that and how that interrupted identity. Um, yeah, so I finished I, going through the, all of those artworks, was only able to identify 36 out of the 124, um, but that ended up being an exhibition um, within the gallery there of the identified ones, and it added so much being able to see like the families that, it was weird because there were two married couples that were identified and a mother-daughter duo out of all of them. Uh, so out of 36 artworks, it's just so, uh, weird that there were so many family connections. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and that's why I really love working uh, within galleries and making my little small um, improvements and uh, support in that way. Yeah, um, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Oli. Wait a sec. I okay. just wanted to, uh, okay. <laughs> since we have you here now on stage, okay. I just wanted to ask you some brief Questions also to provide even more kind of context for the audience, okay. not knowing the National Gallery of, of Canada also. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you, do you remember when you saw the National, or when you visited the National Gallery of Canada for the first time? Was that before kind of the curatorial change process or was it after? No, it, it, uh, the Indigenous Ways and Decolonization Department had just uh, emerged or been created when I first visited. Living it out in Alberta, I didn't get the opportunity to visit until very recently actually, um, just because it was so far. But yeah, I came in uh, or became aware of it right, was, right as it was being developed. And that's how I met Michelle. <laughs> And, yeah. and the reason I asked, because I really wanted to hear your perspectives on that curatorial kind of strategic, strategic change, because I visited the National Gallery of Canada the first time in 2015, yep. and when I came into the museum, I asked where is, where is like the indigenous art, and then you had to go down in the basement. Yeah, for the Inuit. For the Inuit yeah. exhibition, and it was like very kind of hard to find, and it, just the symbolic um, symbolism of having it down in the basement. Yeah. And then, of course, all these changes uh, came, and now, when visiting the exhibitions on National Gallery, the way also the indigenous art is curated is so very different than yeah. it used to be. The, how do you kind of perceive this these strategies today as a young curator? Uh, yeah, I think we're all as a team dedicated to institutional transformation and even when there's pushback against that, we're all very supportive of each other and uh, that's uh, really important to all of us to have in both the permanent spaces, the Indigenous Canadian galleries and the contemporary galleries, having Indigenous artworks in all of those spaces. Um, yeah, so it's been really important being able to uh, be involved with all areas of the gallery rather than just being um, put in one put in one spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, and last, um, how do you think it would have been to work in a national institution, national art institution, as the National Gallery of Canada, if there were no indigenous representation in the leadership of the institution? How oh would that how would that affect your work? Do you think? Uh, I, I think that would be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, I think we just have an implicit understanding of um, the things that we go through as Indigenous people um, 
and and it can be hard and i think that's what's really beautiful about the changes that are happening is that we're creating these networks and these teams that um make it less hard yeah thank you oli thank there you. is some chocolate and a <laughs> walking you. stick for you as well you might have thank to discuss you. that with the airline <laughs> thank you so much Last but not least, um, we're giving the floor to uh, Aula Guttorm, uh, who is the producer of Ijahis Ija Festival in the Finnish side of Sápmi. The floor is yours. Thank you. Nope. Päivi Puhkast, mun nammalle Oula Kutturm ja Tjärvuodast Aanäris. Hello everyone, my name is Oula Kutturm and greetings from, from uh, Inari, Finnish side of Sapmi. <laughs> nice to hear that I have support here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Sami Music Center and uh, Iahi City Festival. Uh, this is something that I've been involved now in 10 years and before that I was working as an, as an agent for, uh, for Sami artists such as uh, Vimme, Ailu Valle and uh, Ulla Pirtjärvi Lansman. So I've been like sitting on the both sides of the, the table like uh, booking artists and uh, also selling artists and then I've been uh, playing myself in these bands as well. So, Sami Music Center, what it is, it is a unit under the uh, Sami Parliament in Finland. We do have three these units, one for music, one for children's culture, and one for uh, films. And what these essentially are, they are like uh, this practical level uh, cultural services that we, we offer to, to Sami. Uh, as we know, the politics is uh, maybe on this upper level, but these are the things that really like are visible to everyday life of, of Sami, at least locally in, in the Finnish side of Sápmi. Uh, we organize uh, workshops, concerts, film screenings and other events. Uh, the units are funded by the Ministry of Culture and Education, but it is through Sami Parliament because it's a part of the Sami self-governance. The state gives the money, but we get to uh, choose what we use it for. Uh, so to the festival then, which is maybe more known known thing. Iahisitja. Um, it's a music festival for, for indigenous uh, peoples. Mostly we do have uh, artists coming from, from uh, Swedish side of Sápmi, Norwegian side of Sápmi and, and in Finland, of course. Before Putin's war in, in Ukraine, we did have artists coming from uh, Siberia as well and Kola Peninsula. We would love to have artists coming more uh, from Canada, but our budget does not share the love, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, we, we have had artists from Canada and, and still, uh, still aim to have, have them in the future as well, but it's not every uh, year thing. Uh, what the program consists of, yeah, gigs and other art performances. We have had theater plays, uh, uh, like book, book seminars and music seminars and uh, yeah, literature as well and uh, yeah, very m many kinds of things besides music. Um, then of course we have own day for, for the children and the youth, which is uh, quite important for us 
because there are workshops for them in which they do not only learn about Sami music, but also uh, from Sami Tuochi, the handcraft, uh, the traditional ways, all in all. So, so it's kind of uh, education for themselves, for the children and the youth, and uh, to, to get them into the culture and uh, like uh, get mot motivation to, to learn the language as well. And yeah, you can see here the dates for, for this upcoming summer's festival, so you are all welcome there, of course. Uh, the aim is to promote traditional and modern Sami music. We do not have so many stages for the traditional Sami music, so for us it is really important to, to give stage every year to the traditional vocal music styles, which in Finland we have three of those, Northern Sami Joik, uh, Skold Sami Leut and Inari Sami Liute. And we give, we give a stage for those, but of course we ha do have modern uh, Sami music artists as, as well. Uh, it's, the festival is a few like performing opportunities that we have in Finland for the artists. We don't, we don't have so many events there where, where they could perform. Uh, we have this kind of newer thing now, which is this talent, talent stage, which is aimed for the up-and-coming young artists to, to get their music to, to the public. Besides the music, what the festival really is, it's a, it's a meeting place for the Sami. Uh, the, may, maybe some of you know that uh, most of the Sami people, at least in Finland, live in the cities. I guess it's the same, same in all these countries. So people from the cities come to, to Inari to see their relatives and their friends, and they get to know it with new people as well. So it's really like this big gathering place for, for, for the Sami. Um, we tend to say that the, that the festival is from the Sami to the Sami, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't like welcome non-Sami people as well. We think it's the festival is like really good uh, tool to to prevent prejudice and even racism. I, and I, I think that we have done that for some some point because we we do have all kinds of people visiting the the festival nowadays. I think ten years ago the situation was was not that. That, that same that most of the audience was Sami, but now there's uh, a lot of, lot of non-Sami non visitors as well who are just interested in, in Sami music or, or the festival in, in general. Uh, next, um, I have some points or insights about the Sami music field in Finland. Mm, I was asked to... to to bring out some challenges and maybe maybe the positive things about it, because I've been well, I know something about it since since I've been working with the festival quite long and before that other other things. So so these are I think for the music artists the the diffi most, most difficult difficult things. We do have only few Sami events and it's difficult to to get gigs to other than Sami events. And then, of course, there's no radio play on other than Sami radio channel. And the grants for, for publishing music or projects there's, is quite small. It's like a it's like few, few thousand euros. And this, this, this makes the situation that only a handful of uh, established artists are able to work full time with music, Sami music in Finland. In the picture is a rap artist Ailu Valle, who has overcome all these challenges. So he's, he's one of the few. Um, maybe, maybe this is something that, uh, or as, as Lars Magne said, that uh, what, what, what is the position of the Sami artists after the cultural capital year? 
And this is maybe something that all 2026 20, could, could think about also, that what, 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 what can they do to, to promote the artists that after the year they, they get gigs and funding to other events as, as well. Uh, to end with positive things, we do have a lot of uh, new and young artists, and the value of traditional music styles is, is now high. And that's very welcome. We do have lots of new, new people who, who have learned the traditional vocal music, music styles. And even though I said we have few events, we, all, we, we do have those few events. So, so it's not dead all, all, all the time. So yeah, I think that's the time, time I had, and I'll thank for the, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Ola. Then it's a brief, fifth, let's say 10 minutes, because you will spend five minutes to get back. 10 minute coffee break and reflect on these perspectives as we step onto the last panels after the break. <laughs>